scripture lesson today is from the book of Luke, chapter 5, verses 1 to 11. Once while Jesus was standing beside the lake of Gennesaret, and the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he saw two boats there at the shore of the lake. The fishermen had gotten out of them and were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little way from the shore. Then he sat down and taught the crowds from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we have worked all night long but have caught nothing. Yet if you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done this, they caught so many fish that their nets were beginning to burst. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. For he and all who were with him were astounded at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Jebedee who were partners with Simon. Then Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on you will be catching people. When they had brought their boats to shore, they left everything and followed him. sinners of repentance. This is the word of the Lord. Okay, 
please stand as we now sing hymn number 189, Fairest Lord Jesus. Christmas. 
At this moment, the Grinch finally understands Christmas. At the same moment, the sled is about to slide off the mountain. And Dr. Seuss tells us. And what happened then? Well, in Whoville, they say that the Grinch's small heart grew three sizes that day. And then the true meaning of Christmas came through, and the Grinch found the strength of ten Grinches plus two. So the Grinch grabs a sleigh, and he returns everything to Whoville. What is amazing in this story is not only the Grinch's redemption, but also the Who's, who totally accepted the Grinch. They welcomed him into their hearts and their homes. They literally led him in to their circle. Christ's reckless love is this. Jesus increases our capacity to love others, even the Grinches we meet along the way. We often think in terms of limited capacity. That is, we assume resources are limited. But most mothers and fathers discover when they become parents of a second child, their ability to love grows to include the second child. There is a Danish proverb that says, when there is room in the heart, there is room in the house. Berlin says that when Christ enters our lives, we are not only able to love our neighbor, but we can also love ourselves. God loves everyone, including us. Consider Simon, a fisherman who lived in Capernaum on the Lake of Gennesaret, also known as the Sea of Galilee. He had a reckless encounter with Christ and came away a man changed because of the results. Simon, we're told, has spent his night fishing. <coughs> it had been an unproductive night, and I assume he is feeling deflated because he has worked all night and returned without any fish. I imagine he wants to forget about the lousy night, and he's ready to go home and to go to sleep. But when Simon arrives back at the shore, he notices a large crowd listening to Jesus. He gets out of the boat and he begins to wash his nets. But Jesus gets in his boat and asks him to push off the shoreline. Jesus asks Simon to do something I am sure that he didn't want to do. But Simon did it anyway. When Jesus had finished speaking to the crowd on the shore, he says to Simon, put out your nets into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. This time, Simon actually questions Jesus' command. And I imagine Simon saying to Jesus in an exhausted voice, Master, we have worked all night, and we have caught nothing. But out of respect for Jesus, he puts down his nets, expecting to catch nothing. So imagine his surprise when his nets are overflowing with fish. He knows a miracle has occurred. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell at Jesus' knee, saying, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. Berlin says, If you want to expand your love for yourself, then you must deal with what you see when you look inside yourself. 
the feelings and memories we bury and try to ignore are likely to come in two forms, shame and guilt. Shame is the result of something that has been done to us. We have not sinned. <coughs> and Berlin uses the example of sexual assault. In recent years, the women who have accused Bill Crosby, Larry Nassar, and Harvey Weinstein of sexual assault have brought to light the pain and shame their victims live with. Feelings of shame happen when people treat other people as less than a child of God. The other kind of feeling we bury are feelings of guilt. These are the things that we did that wounded others. And thereby, they have damaged us. Some examples would be bullying, spreading lies, adultery, neglecting relationships. Like Simon, we keep these parts of ourselves hidden. When Simon encountered Jesus, he knew he couldn't hide the shadow side of his life from Jesus. Guilt requires repentance to be made right with those who have wounded us and with God. Shame, on the other hand, does not require repentance. The challenge is to learn to love oneself. God says to the victim, you are worthy of love. The terrible thing that has been done to you does not define you. You are my beloved child. Jesus wants to heal our feelings of shame. Berlin says, our fear is that God's love is not expansive enough to heal our wounds or gracious enough to forgive our sins. Our thinking can be limited, that we can imagine that God is able to do what we have been unable to accomplish for ourselves. Jesus orders Simon to give up his fears. It is apparent from reading the Gospels that Jesus knows what is going on in the lives of everyone he meets. The same way he knows all about the stuff in your life and mine. Jesus called Simon to join him as he was. You have to hand it to Simon. His response is as reckless as Jesus' offer. And James and John were right behind him. When they brought their boats to shore, they left everything and followed him. Berlin points out that Jesus calls his disciples on a three-year camping trip. I kind of like that. I've not heard that term before. They go on a three-year camping trip. What a nightmare that would be. <laughs> Since they would be living in close quarters, you would think Jesus would seek out like-minded disciples. <coughs> but this is not the case. Earlier we heard about the call of Levi, the tax collector. Tax collectors were despised because they worked for Rome. They would take the taxes that were due to Rome, and then they would take a little bit extra for themselves. But when Jesus said to him, follow me, and he got up, left everything, and followed him. Another memorable disciple is Judas Iscariot. And we know how he turned out. Jesus intentionally chooses a diverse group of men as his disciples. 
Berlin bemoans the fact that many of our congregations are made up of like-minded people. If the pastor or the church members express a difference of opinion about scripture, they leave the church. He says, churches that once enjoyed a broad array of members who were bound by a common love of Christ are now defined by a narrower adherence to a set select cluster of conclusions that are seen as limited tests of the true faith. The saints of glory have been substituted with the saints of uniformity. I gotta tell you, here at Whiting United Methodist Church, I really hope that we don't agree on everything. I think it makes for a much more interesting and exciting congregation. And certainly, it's more like the disciples, a diverse group of people. One look at the group Jesus first assembled as his followers tells us that something is lost when sameness is the defining characteristic of a church. Jesus' example teaches us that something is wrong when we leave our people who differ from us and only feel at home when everyone is the same. His goal is not to make us more of what we are, but to help us become what we can be. That requires us to expand our understanding of what it means to love our neighbor. Christ shows us that the only way to learn the greatest commandment is to have people in our lives who we personally find so difficult to love that we have to get up every morning and pray to our Creator for a love we cannot produce on our own. Just as an aside, as, as I'm reading this, I'm thinking, there were years I would say to my husband, my daughter Libby was really a challenge. And I would say, this relationship is not working for me. <laughs> you know, there are some relations that just don't work for us sometimes, and they're really hard. But you know what? She's grown up and she's a great kid. <laughs> so we just need to hang in there. The first disciples had to ask God to expand their hearts so they could overlook the past sins of the tax collector. What up with the ideological torpedo the zealot launched at breakfast? Ignore the brother's latest argument? Or figure out it was time to confront the group's treasurer who they thought was embezzling funds? <laughs> Jesus invites us to let our nets down in the unfamiliar water with unfamiliar people to draw the circle wide. Earlier we had heard Nancy sing the lyrics by Gordon Light. Draw the circle, draw the circle wide. Draw the circle, draw the circle wide. No one stands alone. We will stand side by side. This week, I hope we can find an opportunity to expand our circle of caring by just one person. Amen. Uh, this morning, our prayers are asked for the family of Fred and Carrie. He passed away. Let us pray. <laughs> Loving God, on this holiday weekend, we recognize that our nation bears many burdens. We don't trust our leaders. We cannot find ways to work together for common good. We allow the least among us to suffer and languish. We lose our children to endless gun violence, conflicts, and wars. 
We fixate on what divides us rather than on what brings us together as one people. Remind us this weekend of our calling. Remind us of our common creed that all people are created equal. Inspire us to ensure that all of your children enjoy life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Help us to be profoundly grateful for our freedom and security, to never take these gifts for granted, and to use them for the betterment of all. God of all life, may peace and justice fill out our land and indeed the whole world. We pray this morning for the escalating tension and violence at home and around the world, where safety is threatened, where freedoms are denied, where life is treated as less than sacred. And we also lift up to you, Lord, those who are on our prayer list, and we ask prayers for the family of Fred and Carrie as they mourn his passing. Gracious God, may we learn to draw the circle wide so no one stands alone, but we stand side by side. Amen. Amen. <coughs>